beautiful humans. Welcome to another episode of Role Models, Juicy Conversations with Beautiful Humans. I'm Jennifer Norman, founder of the Human Beauty Movement and your host. This podcast thrives on your support. So if you like what you hear, follow us, rate us, review us, and share this episode with everyone you know across your networks. My guest today is John David Latta. John is an author, teacher, and successful founder and CEO of a multi-million dollar consumer products company. He recently wrote a book called The Synchronous of love, which reveals the radical transformation he underwent when he discovered unconditional love. Today, John coaches others on leadership, healing, transformation, and waking up to expand the human experience. Welcome, John. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the intro. I'm super happy to be here. I'm delighted to have you here. So now I am so eager to learn about your story. How did you begin your transformational journey? Well, like a lot of people, I began with pain and suffering. It seems to be the entryway to a lot of transformation for a lot of people. Approximately 20 years ago, I went through a, I led a relatively charmed life up to that point. And boy, my wife got cancer, ended up having her thyroid gland removed, had to take a synthetic thyroid hormone for the rest of her life just to survive. She went through a dramatic transformation herself. In the middle of it all, I made the glorious choice of leaving my very secure sort of corporate job and starting my own company. Promptly lost all of our money and was in debt $650,000, 250 50,000 in personal credit card debt alone. And then in the middle of it all, my wife and I got divorced. We're facing bankruptcy. And weirdly, at the same time, I had this unbelievable fear of death coming over me. Through that stage of my life, I had zero interest in spirituality or religion. And so I wouldn't have even known who to turn to with this fear. And I didn't even know who to ask. So I ran around behind closed doors, this horrible fear of death. And so in a relatively short period of time, I went from charmed life to bad husband, bad father, bad businessman and a man running around behind closed doors in terrible fear of death and ended up, like I said, probably hanging on by the skin of my teeth for two or three years with custody of my two kids who are 9-11. And every day was unbelievable, painful challenge. And so I broke down and went to my first ever spiritual retreat. And it was a really hard thing to stomach. It's sort of like being a Nazi skinhead and deciding you love all people. <laughs> I mean, the, the shock, I mean, it was just terrifying to me, but I was looking for a lifeline and Michael Crichton, the author, who I loved and got to meet and got to know some of his inner circle, he wrote a book called Travels, a nonfiction autobiography book, interesting, written in the same format that mine is. It's just a series of short, true stories. And, and he had gone to this retreat in the desert with a teacher by the name of Dr. William Brew Joy. He went by his middle name and highly intelligent medical man who became a spiritual teacher. And so I went and I remember signing up for it going, well, I'm $650,000 in debt another couple thousand won't matter if I end up going under. So I went and I didn't have a lot of spiritual experiences, but the very opening for me was discovering, I didn't realize how much I kept people at a distance. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I think I'd ever experienced true intimacy with other people. And I loved it and I craved it. And I came back, life was still difficult. My company was hanging by a thread. I was juggling finances left and right, trying to be both mom and dad to my two kids. And very slowly over time, I had started as a consequence of that, workshop practice of heart-centered meditation. And I was fairly regular with that. And then about a year after that retreat, Brew put up a dream form online and I joined and started sharing dreams, which prior to that, I'd never had any dreams. And I couldn't understand the language of dreams. People would post dreams. I'm like, how the heck did you come up with that kind of conclusion? And so that took a while too. It took me about a year. And I would say even to this day, I'm learning the language of dreams and everything in my life started to change after that everything. Wow. So you had gone through a whole lot of getting down into the ashes. And so how was it being a CEO and being in this place where some people would consider it rock bottom and then all of a sudden going through this spiritual transformation and then trying to run a company as you did? Yeah, that was amazing in itself. And sometimes it almost felt surreal going to work. So a couple things, you know, when you're in something, you can't see it. It's only in retrospect, you can look at and go, oh my God, that's the process I was in. Boy, that was actually really important. And at the same time I was going through the spiritual transformation, I had started therapy and group therapy. In the blink of an eye, I was in a group that most of the time were all women and two women therapists. And so like we talked about a little bit before the show began, it was sort of like my initiation or baptism into all things feminine. And even Brew, the spiritual teacher was encouraging. And he goes, it's not like you're going to lose your highly developed masculine. They'll augment each other. 
other. It isn't like you have to trade one for the other. And that gave me a lot of peace. And so, oh my God, sitting there in therapy and having to open up and be vulnerable and be honest and authentic. Oh, it was terrifying. <laughs> But as a consequence, I found as a CEO, I was much more willing to engage people, employees, uh, salespeople, everybody at a deeper, more authentic level. And it was beautiful. It wasn't all surface. It wasn't all wearing masks anymore. And so I think as a consequence, I became a more, a better listener, more compassionate, more understanding, more curious about the depth in other people and other employees and people I dealt with. There was definitely a lot more patience, which I probably wasn't high on my scale of things I was good at when I was younger. <laughs> and again, you know, we talked a little bit about it before the show uh, when the Kundalini energy came on. Boy, that was a trip. And I think, again, it was one of the most blessed times of my life, but it was also harrowing and terrifying at times. And I was just the most, the greatest fear was I was going to be, even though I wasn't doing drugs at any time, that I was going to have some kind of a bad trip and be weird and not be able to run my company and be father to my two kids, not be a responsible human being. And again, now looking back, I can see I was definitely able to do both, but I didn't think I was going to at the time. Now, I think that that is worth taking pause and mentioning again. Here you were, I would say, a cisgender white male CEO, the stereotypical dominant male within our society, afraid that you were not going to be able to lead if you adopted some feminine traits. Only to That's find, exactly right. <laughs> only yeah. to find that it actually probably made you more of a whole person. Yeah, you nailed it. That's exactly right. It doesn't sound very sexy, but wholeness is amazing. And most of the time I'm generalizing, probably don't realize how one-sided we can be, especially some of us are rigid, rational males. We don't know what we're missing. And sometimes I like to say, you don't know what you don't know. And I'll share a story from my book early on in my journey. The gals in my group therapy group were getting on me about being. John, you need, you're so good at doing, you need to try being. I'm like, what the hell is being? You know, I can't even conceptualize it. Well, so I'm, I've been in management since I was 18. And so I'm really good at chop, chop, getting things done, staying on step schedule. And I'm tucking my kids in bed, tuck my daughter in, go over trying to tuck my son in and he's babbling away about his day all excitedly. I want to be quiet so I can turn off the light and tuck him in and go to sleep because I have things to do. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try what these ladies keep telling me. So I thought, maybe I'll just sit on the edge of bed, just listen, just listen. And I don't know, maybe 30 seconds go by and Jennifer suddenly am overwhelmed with this feeling of love that I've never felt in my life. Like this unbelievable feeling. And suddenly I love my son's excited babbling. And I'll never forget it. I remember going, getting in bed later going, wow, maybe these women have something to show me and teach me. Like I was a lot more humble when I went back to my group after that. Like, wow, what had I been missing my whole life? Yeah. Sometimes we think that being busy is living, but it truly isn't. It's almost like an excuse or a surrogate for living. And the real living happens when we get quiet. And sometimes when we do nothing and we do more listening yeah. than doing, being a human being, not a human doing. <laughs> That is, that is beautiful. Now you mentioned Kundalini energy, and I know some of our listeners are probably not familiar with Kundalini. Can you explain that to us? I can. And so Kundalini comes from, I think, more of the Sanskrit, uh, I'm going to loosely call it Hindu tradition out of India. But supposedly every single human being has what looks like a tiny worm. They call it a little serpent that's about three inches long, and it lives kind of in your perineum area. And when the person is ready, this little worm, this energy goes goes up through the chakras, it follows the central channel of the spine, going from the root in the perineum area all the way up to the crown. And it's purifying and cleansing everything. And everybody's process is different. Sometimes people feel a lot of energy, sometimes a little, sometimes there's tremendous visionary experiences, sometimes not much at all. But the process can be both beautiful, like amazing experiences happen and painful too, because there's sort of this cleansing and purifying of all the stuff you may have encountered in this lifetime and maybe even past lifetimes. But all traditions talk about this. Literally all traditions talk about it. You know, I think in Christians, they call it the movement of the Holy Spirit. And I think they all argue with each other. But if you step back from it all, you see that every tradition talks about there can be a time in a person's life when they go through a tremendous amount of energy and transformation. And it feels like purification or cleansing or something like that. Now, again, traditionally, Kundalini is thought of as sexual energy, feminine energy, earth energy. It's very powerful. It's really amazing. And mine was over the top. Like some of the stories in my book just kind of cracked me up looking back. Like my instant experience was I had goddesses galore in my dreams. I had, <laughs> sounds funny, sex with 
every goddess imaginable in my dreams. It was like, and my dreams were full of women. I remember them telling me, we're going to teach you everything. And everything was going to be completely different from everything I'd learned before. I had countless dreams of giant serpents, giant cobras. And thank God I wasn't afraid of snakes because they would have been really terrifying. And the energy felt blissful and orgasmic. It sometimes felt like I was being shocked by heart paddles. Like I would wake up just sweating. And it was grand and dramatic and over the top. And my theory about it is because I had so kept this feminine energy away from me that it came crashing through in a big way. And I think other people that might be more balanced to begin with might not have quite as intense an experience as I had had. Because I've heard other people say Kundalini at the end is just balancing energy. If you're out of balance, here comes the other half or the other side. Mm -hmm. And boy, that pendulum seems to have swung for you. Violently. So what was the process that got you into kundalini energy? Were there breathing techniques? Was there assistance from plant medicine? Tell us all, all that you can. None of that. So I was one of the ones that had what they call spontaneous opening. And so the only thing I was doing was heart-centered meditation. And I have reflected on that because there are people that have been doing kundalini yoga and trying to cultivate that energy for decades and not much has happened. Now, in truth, something might be happening. It just, like I said, I think in my case, this other, half was coming in in a big way because it was so completely unfamiliar to me and I was out of balance. But there were no practices other than heart-centered meditation and what we would just call shadow work. And I think there was some part of me that had started the process, but I was unconscious of it at the time. Very wanted to heal a lot of things in myself. Very willing to see, you know, you've heard the saying triggers, you know, we caught it. They say sometimes if you spot it, you got it. And I was very willing to look myself in the mirror and say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that too. And so I think there was a lot of on my own sort of a purifying process or a cleaning up process on my own. And then the energy was ready to come through. But to be really bluntly honest with you, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I think there's just something I'm just going to loosely call it divine timing. It was just time. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I love books like Michael Singer's book, The Surrender Experiment. I don't know if you ever read that. And, you know, the change came out of nowhere. And so I don't know. Adya Shanti is a popular spiritual teacher and he's written a lot of interesting books about enlightenment. And he just says it is normal for a lot of people to go through a period of time where they just have encounters with energy and a lot of energetic experiences, visionary experiences. And then they tend to fade over time. And, and that was my experience exactly. Mm. And a lot of people who have gone through trauma and are open because they've been humbled enough and they've released the ego, they know that there's nothing that they can lose. You're like, what's a couple thousand dollars more? You know, you were (laughs) completely receptive and open to anything that was going to come your way in order to provide any kind of answers or elucidation. And sometimes that level of cooperation leads to the cooperative incidents that, you know, helps you transform into a spiritual awakening. And so, yeah, sometimes it is only when you look back that you do realize and recognize, yeah, that must have been the trigger. The trigger. I agree with you. And I think you brought up a good point. Sometimes you practice, 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 practice is still in a way, not all the time, most of the time a doing. Yes. But sort of that surrendered humbleness, you know, where you're starting to confront your own stuff, your own shadows, and you're willing to take them on with a sort of compassionate way can open an awful lot of doors as well. And so sometimes the doorway in is just through surrender and allowing. Yeah, for a lot of my life, I lived in masculine energy because I felt that that was the way to be independent, have a burgeoning career, get ahead. I got the MBA and my life was filled with doing. It was filled with actioning, but not really a lot of soul purpose. And so I was getting in my own way of a transformation. And it was only until I did surrender and I said, you know what, I'm just going to let what be happen. And that's when the divine feminine started working. And that's when doors started opening and more cooperative incidences started to come and be exposed into my being. And then you realize, oh, this is what's going on in life. You see life with completely fresh eyes as if you were a newborn. I totally hear you. That's been my journey as well. 
Right, right. So now when you were going through your dreams and your mystical en encounters, you also were in a bit of pain. You had some neck pain and back pain, and this actually yeah. seemed to have helped you get rid of some chronic pains. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I'll show two stories where that happened. There's a number of stories like that where sometimes I'm just like, God, I, it makes me wonder if healing is just way easier than we make it. Yeah. And so the first one, I had been rear-ended in a car crash and for six years had chronic neck pain. And I was very athletic and I was like, I can't believe I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. And man, I tried everything. I tried a stand-up desk. I tried sitting on bouncy balls at work. I tried getting up and moving. I tried all the neck and stretching exercises I could. I tried acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, and even went so far as to get facet joint injections of cortisone in my neck and nothing worked. It would work for a few days and then be right back again. So remember I told you we, I had started that dream form, right? And one day I come home from work half hour before my kids get off the school bus and I lay in bed and I'm in tears. Like, I can't believe I'm going to have to live this way the rest of my life. And as I fall, I go to take a little nap and as I fall asleep, I'm saying, why that, excuse my French, why the fuck does my neck hurt so bad? And this dream comes through like, boom, an answer. But the dream is a monk with shaved head and a red robe pacing back and forth outside my house. End of dream. And I'm like, I don't have any idea how that has anything to do with my neck. So I got on the dream forum and I worked with some others and Brew himself got on there and he goes, that dream has everything to do with why your neck hurts. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Help me. And so long story short, again, you know, this is part of the beauty of dream work is we have many, you might say, parts of self. And so John, you have a very spiritual side, a monk side, a selfless service side, and you're complete denial of it. Try to just open up again, come to this sort of acceptance, open up the idea that maybe you're actually a very spiritual person. And you might say, allow him into your house because right now you got him locked out and he's just waiting, but he doesn't want to come in. So I'm like, okay, I guess a few months goes by another dream. And this time Bruce coming towards me with his hands, hands on healing. He's going to heal the pain in my neck. And as he reaches for my neck, I'm like, oh my God, thank God. Somebody's going to heal me. Finally, I, in my dream, I see an angry old man lives in my neck and he looks up and says, get the fuck away. And so again, it, it took time. Sometimes dreams take time, but I started to realize like a lot of people, I carry resistance in my neck and you might call it resistance to change. And boy, when you're really inundated with a lot of feminine stuff, there's a lot of, there's a lot of new things coming at you. And the part of the masculine part that likes to be controlled and in order, you know, he was just overwhelmed with everything that was going on. So again, I started like going, wow, so I carry resistance in my neck. I have an angry old man in my neck. He's not letting anything in. And I started opening and opening and relax. And then came the culminating dream two years later, where I have a golden thumbtack in my hand. I'm sitting in my office and I reached to push it into the wall behind me. And I look back and I pushed it right into the heart of this beautiful Tibetan monk who's just looking at me with such love. And I punctured his heart with it. And I realized my neck didn't hurt anymore. And to this day, I just have to be conscious that once in a while, I can feel stress building in my neck. And I just have to consciously allow it to go and just relax. So all that chronic neck pain was gone. And I'll share one more story. Again, one of the things I learned in this journey is how much all of us, myself especially, get sort of entrenched in habits. And the idea is to break out of the habits and start to open your eyes and your mind to new ways of seeing and being. So I used to own a company. I used to fly probably 20 to 25 times a year and typically had to fly across the country for a 30 minute meeting, then fly all the way back. So this time I was flying from Seattle to Jacksonville, Florida, connection in Dallas. And the night before I threw my back out, I thought, oh God, I know how this is going to go. You know, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to sit on an airplane seat for, you know, all day and then a 30 minute meeting and then all the way back the next day. I wouldn't be able to walk after this is over. And as I get up in the morning, hoping for a miracle, nope, my back still hurts. It's terrible. I can barely get in and out of my car. So I'm standing in line of security. I'm just a few people away from the TSA agent grumbling and just stealing myself for how difficult this is going to be. And all of a sudden there's a voice singing the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy in my head. And suddenly I had this like this, oh, and I could feel that the song was being aimed at my lower back. And I knew that, that vibration and sound could be healing. And I just knew there was like this intuition, like stop bitching about how it's going to be. And I started, I started humming the song myself. I started humming the chorus to don't worry, be happy. And the nice thing about
about airports and airplanes is there's so much noise that no ambient noise, nobody can hear you, right? And so I hummed all the way to Dallas. I hummed all the way to Jacksonville. It, it was the strangest experience of my life. I sat in the window seat, all four of those flights. I had an impossibly large person in the middle seat every single time. Every single time the voice in my head would say, oh my God, now you're going to have to sit crooked. Your back's really going to hurt. But I just kept humming the song and trying to imagining that happy tune being aimed at my lower back. On a scale of one to 10, if I started at a six and was sure I was going to be a nine at the end of the trip and went from a six to a one. Mm -hmm. And so that's another, it's a crazy thing, but you know, everybody hurts themselves, but you can encourage healing in the body by thinking happy thoughts, thinking positive thoughts, humming happy tunes instead of thinking this is terrible. It's going to take so long to heal. And so a whole lot of stories in my book are just like that, where I had this experience and I learned a lot from it been able to carry it forward. Mm, and you're so right. I remember hearing stories about the difference and, and some people would call it the placebo effect. But if there is something that can cause your mindset and your vibration, your vibration to be elevated and your mindset to be in a more positive channel, then you will have a greater opportunity for healing and for success and for good things to come your way versus otherwise. And so, you know, I think that our own attitude is our biggest placebo if we can only tap into that more often. I totally agree with you. And I know that myself, but even now I sometimes forget. It's just, I'm aware that my own brain seems wired for predictability and habits. And I, I remember 20 years ago, my therapist saying, John, I have clients I can point across that little bridge and say, yes, the grass really is greener over there, but they won't go over there because their discomfort and their pain is the known. And they're more comfortable with they know, even if the other side will probably be better. There's more fear of uncertainty in the unknown. And so it's sort of, you know, they tell you sometimes you don't have to listen to the thoughts that come up in your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And because I think a lot of times the thoughts that bubble up are just habitual and designed to recreate scenarios over and over again, even if they're painful. Absolutely. I would love to dive more into how you got into analyzing your dreams. And a lot of people are those, you know, similar to me, actually, I wake up and I forget that I've even dreamed. I forget that I've had visions unless they are extremely vivid. How can people cultivate their dreams and visions? Yeah, that's a great question. And I encourage it for everybody. Grab a pen or a notebook or a recording device, put it next to your bed. And when you go to bed at night and you're starting to fall asleep or you start to feel like you're drifting off a little bit, try and imagine in your mind's eye that you've walked up to the edge of a cliff and you've removed all your clothes completely naked, turn your back to the abyss. And just as you're starting to drift off to sleep, ask for a dream and fall off backwards in total trust. And it might not happen the first night or the second or the third, but if you go in intentionally and say, I want to remember my dreams and just do this process, it might take anywhere from a day to a week, they're going to come and they'll come to the degree that you want them to come. There was a period of time I had to say, no more dreams because <laughs> they were overwhelming and just write them down. And if they seem like a foreign language to you, just keep writing them down. There's lots of good dream books out there. I like all of Robert Moss's books. He has great stuff about dreams, but you're in part going to have to learn the language of dreams yourself. Dreams can have a very personal meaning. They can have kind of a collective or tribal meaning. They can have a universal meeting and it can be really difficult. But if you understand they're speaking to you primarily through symbols, then the dream starts to make sense. And I would say most people, most of the time, dreams are what I would just loosely call of a psychological nature. Sometimes it's just your mind trying to make sense of stress you encounter during the day. Sometimes dreams are healing. It's trying to resolve or release something that has happened in your life. But if you allow that process to take place, the beautiful part is then dreams can take on a whole new level where what feels like you're communicating with guides or angels or, you know, higher self wisdom, ascended masters, the whole realm of what I would call revelation starts to come in. Not all the time. And those are the beautiful dreams. Judith Orloff wrote a great book called Second Sight that I highly recommend about that. And she talks about the different kinds of dreams. And so just keep going with the process. And even if you keep writing them down, if nothing else, it's great fodder for creative material if you wanted to write fiction books. <laughs> 
amazing what can come through dreams. But you can see sometimes the same theme happening time after time after time. And then it shifts. There's like a dramatic shift. And almost inevitably, when that shift takes place, some dramatic shift is going to take place in your outer life as well. And so Jung used to say, the beauty of paying attention to dreams is you start to live less by fate and accident because you actually start to see it's almost like you're having your own little inner astrology readings. When the shifts take place within, they start to take place in the outer world as well. Mm, Fascinating. And it's intriguing. I have read a couple of dream books and it is fascinating to see that there are certain themes when it comes to dreaming about animals or dreaming about situations and whatnot. I have also, on the other hand, been part of forums where people will say, can you please read my aura? And there'll be many as many interpretations as there are people in the forum. (laughs) And so I would say to your point, you know, use your judgment that these are your dreams their interpretation could be very personal. If you ask somebody else to interpret for you, they're going to be viewing it or interpreting it based upon their filter of what their experience has been. And so, you know, use caution, use a grain of salt when you go for just like giving up your dreams to somebody else. It's, it often requires your own personal and intimate reflection and meditation. I agree. Sometimes like for me in the beginning, it's actually helpful to have other people telling you what your dreams mean, but I still would agree with you. Hold it lightly. It's not the last word on the subject. And, but eventually, yeah, the goal should be, these are my dreams. I need to make sense of them and nobody can do that better than me. Yeah. And so stepping from dreams over to synchronicity, I know some people are like, well, how can I build more synchronicity in my life? Are there some things that you had done that you can put a finger on that may have led you to improving your synchronicity? Yeah, I think, okay. So two things. So the first process I did was heart-centered meditation. Heart-centered meditation, you know, a lot of people, people don't know this about the heart center. You know, people that are familiar with the chakra systems kind of know what each of the chakras are and what they're, what they do and their state of consciousness, you might say. But the heart is unique because it sits in the center and it actually unifies all the upper chakras that some people loosely call heaven. And it unifies all the lower chakras that some people loosely call earth. And so you might say it kind of unifies that sort of transcendent experience with a very grounded, practical reality. And so a lot of people that are what I'm going to say walking sort of that middle path where they want to be that kind of grounded, practical human, but want to have contact with more mystical realms too, or a sense of oneness. The heart center is a beautiful place to begin. And I found the more time I spent in the heart center and more I started to appreciate others and other aspects of life through the eyes of unconditional love rather than judgment or fear, great things started to happen. It was miraculous. You know, what I call synchronicities, some people would call flow or a whole series of coincidences, or a lot of people would call miracles. It's actually unbelievable. But over time, looking back, I think if you realize most of us are a divine being having a human experience, but most of us have an ego identity that at least when we're younger is separate from that more divine identity. The more I would say you surrender yourself as the ego to being in service to that divine being and start to merge the two, shit happens. But I don't mean bad shit. I mean good shit. It's actually, and so I don't care what you call it. You know, they might say turning your life over to God as you understand it. It might be, you know, to a Christian, it might be, hey, Jesus, you take the wheel. Somebody else, it might be not my will, but thy will. Whatever that looks like to you, I just say, I know I'm this divine being. I want to be in alignment with that. And I think that's what Einstein was referring to when he said, intuition is the gift and logic is its faithful servant. But we've elevated the servant and forgotten the gift. Mm -hmm. And so so the more you can stay in that sort of intuitive divine space and be in alignment with that, miracles happen, coincidences happen, things you didn't think were possible happen. <laughs> yeah, it feels like I'm manifesting instantly. It's sometimes almost eerie how quickly you think about something. Oh my God, there it is. And so that would be the two things, trying to move beyond fear and judgment into some grander space that I'm going to call unconditional love and that we can all find right here in our heart center and asking, like, I want to be in alignment with my higher self, my soul, my divine being, and then watch what happens. Mm, I love that you mentioned that because I recall my own aha moment of finding out how I could get over some certain blockages in my life and, you know, certain hurdles certain obstacles, whatever you might call it, challenges and whatnot. And it was really the moment that I turned myself over from becoming an individual and an ego to becoming a vessel of energy and understanding that the energy was just flowing through me. And I was just 
the vehicle through which it was going to flow. It was originally getting trapped in my ego. It was getting trapped in my body and it was causing all sorts of suffering and locking up and constriction. And you'd feel it. You'd feel this discomfort and you'd feel fear and you'd feel anger and you'd feel resentment and all of these negative energies that were just culminating because they were getting stuck like a reservoir in my ego. And surrendering that and recognizing, yes, I am here to be a vessel, to be a messenger, to be a channel of a greater power, some higher purpose that is calling through me. And if I just step out of the way and let it happen, then that's what is going to lead to all of these wonderful manifestations. Yeah, I totally agree. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, John, this was fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for being my guest today on Role Models. I will put all of your information in show notes so people know where to find you. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Thank you so much, Jennifer. Love chatting with you and really appreciate the invitation to be on your show. Mm